Hi. Hi, Mike. How are you? How are you? Yeah, not bad, thanks. Yeah, good. How are you doing today? What, what time is it there? It is now 20 to 8 in the evening. Okay, and I see a fire going on behind yeah, you. Yeah, it's got pretty cold today. It froze last night, so. Oh, dear. Yeah. It's and, nice. Uh, how was your day? Yeah, I'm pretty good. Fairly quiet, though. Did some work, went for a walk in the park. Nice. And Saturdays. Awesome. It's... Okay. Okay, you ready to do this? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, how would you like me to introduce you? Yikes, I don't know, I don't know. My what friend Mike Parker. Okay. <laughs> All right, do you trust me to introduce you then? Sure. All right. Hi, I'm Dave Gray, founder of the School of the Possible, where we're exploring a new approach to learning. Most schools focus on teaching existing facts. In the School of the Possible, we focus on possible facts, things that do not yet exist, but could be so. The school is about creating the future, but it is rooted in the present. No matter who you are or where you are, there is a best next step for you, a step that you can take, a step toward a better, more fulfilling, more meaningful life and work, a step toward a better world. That's the art of the possible, the art of the best next step. And it starts now. Welcome to the art of the possible. I'm Dave Gray, your host. And with me today is Mike Parker. Mike is a longtime friend and colleague and a, he is my personal coach and mentor and also a, um, a professional coach who works with people to help them develop better relationships with their unconscious mind. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And I know we met when I was writing my book, Liminal Thinking, and you were inspired by the conversations enough to name your company liminal coaching and build on the kind of shared ideas that we developed some of them together yeah talk to me a little bit about when you say when you talk about liminal coaching what does that mean what, it, what how do you when you use the word liminal in your business what do you mean by that something quite specific first of all it's from the latin lyman meaning a doorway or a threshold and that's exactly the way in which i use the term and in this case the doorway and the threshold in question is that shifting ground between the conscious and subconscious or unconscious minds interesting okay and let's talk about uh, so i noticed you said subconscious or unconscious. I don't know. I think it's because I've read a lot of Carl Jung, and I think he uses the term unconscious because, uh, but I've noticed he used the word subconscious. Is there a distinction between those two? Or In the way I use them, they're referring to anything which isn't currently conscious content. So I use them interchangeably. Unconscious could be taken to mean just spark out, like under anesthetic. Yeah. Um, True. Subconscious, subconscious has, I think, the implication that there's a lot of other stuff going on. So perhaps I should stick to that. And subconscious, maybe more on the mark. Let's just let's just figure that uh, the words subconscious and unconscious in this conversation are interchangeable. And yeah, I mean, that's good. Basically, anything that you're not conscious of at yeah. the current moment, and th that's interesting to me because the stream of consciousness, your stream of consciousness is just what you happen to be paying attention to at the moment. So it's just a tiny, it's it's a tiny sliver of all the things that you know. Yeah, absolutely. So just, could you, would you make, maybe just give us a working definition of what is the conscious mind and what is the unconscious or subconscious mind and what's one versus the other? I think what we normally refer to as the conscious mind and think of as, even think of as I, is what the decision-making bits in these two tablespoons of brain here which are the prefrontal cortex. And 
I think arguably, and I believe there's some debate about this now, the prefrontal cortex or cortices together, they're capable of processing uh, up to something like 70 bits of information per second, just 70 bits of information per second. So by the time we are thinking about something, making a decision about it, the amount of data we've taken in has been paired right down because the human nervous system is taking in about 200 megabits per second. So right. what I call the what I call the unconscious is everything that deals with the other one hundred and ninety nine point nine nine megabits of information that we're receiving. Yeah. Okay. So it's a lot, and basically, it's like a it's like a needle in a haystack, essentially. The relationship between the conscious and the unconscious. I think that the subconscious is the biggest unrecognized friend, assistant, and pal that we have. If you think about the fact that your subconscious processes are constantly managing the symphonic integration of billions of different things happening in your body, your brain, your mind, your digestion, your breathing, in order to keep you alive every second, it does it perfectly. Yeah. That's an awesome resource, I think. Okay. And then when we talk about stream of consciousness, what is what do you how does that factor into your thinking about the mind and how it works? I think that there's a constant interflow between the conscious and subconscious. I think the subconscious is constantly presenting filtered information, suggestions, ideas, and possibilities to the conscious mind, which then filters them, it's then filtered down and censored so that the conscious mind the prefrontal cortex can cope with it. So I think there's a constant interchange. But the but because of the way that we've been trained and the way that our culture has developed in a way which kind of denigrates anything except conscious rational thinking, we don't have a very good but that relationship isn't very good. It's not very consciously nurtured or recognized. So a lot of the time we end up fighting our own uh, subconscious prompting trying so, to think um, something else. Let's talk a little bit about the relationship with the un unconscious or the uh, the unconscious mind and how um, that connects with the art of the possible. The way that I talk about the art of the possible, I like to talk about it as the art of discovering and finding your best next step. Hmm. What's possible for you? What we're given your best understanding of the situation you're in and the best possible creative imagination about what could possibly happen next. How can your unconscious help you get a, either get a better sense of where you're at or get a better sense of what possibilities are around you or both? Hmm. So let's just take a, a very brief example. If you're anxious, then what's happened is that you, at a subconscious level, your brain has released cortisol and adrenaline into your system. And cortisol has the effect of shutting down your higher brain, your creativity centers. So it reduces your ability to come up with a solution. So one of the first things we do with liminal coaching is to actually work on helping people to reduce the levels of background anxiety and background stress. And that then opens up a huge range of possibilities. It's the range of possibilities that occur when you stop worrying and you have moments of clarity because you're not panicking, you're not worrying, you're not freezing. That's interesting. That makes me think of daydreaming. I know you've talked a lot about daydreaming. What is daydreaming? Daydreaming is a superpower. And we actually recommend people stop at least once an hour and spend deliberately spend three to five minutes daydreaming. We have guided daydreams that we use in liminal coaching. At a technical level, what happens is that the default mode network tends to switch on, and the default mode network does an awful lot of very useful processing for us. Let's. That's a great next question for me. If you just gave me is what is the default mode network? It is actually a large neural network. It's a, a, a number of different brain areas which start operating together uh, in symphony when we go into daydream. 
or when we're just idling. It used to be called the idle state of the brain until about 2012 when Rachel and Shulman redefined it as being a definite state and started seriously investigating it. Since then, it's um, been the subject of a lot of different investigation with a lot of different results and very interesting and widely varied results. But it's definitely implicit in creativity. In fact, recent research has stated that it's causal in creative thinking, the default mode network. It's interesting because when you say the word idling, I think of a car. When a car, you turn it on, it's idling, the engine. When they started investigating it in 2012, they found out that it wasn't being idle at all. It was actually often using a lot more energy than in task-focused thinking. And it was doing a huge amount of stuff, uh, amongst other things, processing memories. And the de default mode network switches on when you're in REM sleep as well. So it processes memories by taking most of the, draining most of the emotion out of the memory for one thing. And the second thing it Whoa. does is, is to put it onto the narrative timeline, gives it a position in your personal history. And it's so important. We're still discovering, like just scratching the surface of how much it does. When the default mode network is operating, one of the things that it's doing, for example, is actually creating uh, solutions to very complex problems. What does it mean to have a, well, let's say, let's say that the conscious and the unconscious, we all have a conscious and subconscious or unconscious mind. And I know you talk about having a, a good relationship or a productive relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Carl Jung talked about that as well, that there's a, they're almost like two celestial objects orbiting around each other. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's like a planet orbiting around the sun because the unconscious is so huge compared to the conscious mind yeah, that's possible actually that's an interesting idea so what is a good what is how do you how does a good relationship with your unconscious what does that look like and how does that help create more possibilities in your life i think a good relationship with your unconscious looks like not being frightened of it learning some ways of speaking with it and appreciating its language. Metaphor is the language par excellence of the subconscious. And paying attention, bothering to nurture it, rather like a, a friendship or an, a personal relationship. So to have a good relationship of my subconscious, uh, this is not a joke, but it sounds like one, you have to be conscious of it. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually true. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and liminal coaching is called liminal coaching because it specializes in actually creating that space where the two types of con the two, the unconscious and the conscious can actually come close to one another and exchange and talk. Okay, let's just say we're starting from a point, and I think many of the people who are watching or listening to this are starting from a point where, oh, I haven't, I haven't really thought about my unconscious. I don't know if I have a good relationship or a bad, I don't even know. It's my relationship with my unconscious is like the relationship to someone I just met on the street, never even had a conversation with them. I don't remember my dreams. Uh, I don't really think I, of course I daydream. I'm, it's just maybe my silent partner or my invisible friend that I never met before. Mm -hmm. How would I know if given that kind of a starting point, how would I know if I have if I have a good or bad relationship with my unconscious, what, what kind of indicators would I see one way or another? I think that you could be pretty sure that the relationship wasn't great if you were constantly fearful of what was happening. If you felt that there were uncontrolled explosions of emotion, pain, worry, mm -hmm. and thought happening to you, and it feels like you can't control them. If you're having anxiety and panic attacks, if you're experiencing overwhelm, all of those things would indicate that, that there's not a great relationship happening there or that there is a lot of accumulated stress and unprocessed tension at a subconscious level. I'd say a lot of people probably feel that way, especially these days. Uh, I think so. Not yeah. only is the world creating a lot of stress and anxiety just because of what's going on, but I think a lot of the technologies, social media, a lot of the incentives that 
the technologies have to increase engagement creates a lot of fear and anxiety. Yeah. Either yeah. The... yeah. All right. So let's say I am feeling stressed out. Let's say I'm feeling anxious. What's a good first step? Breathe. Breathe. <laughs> But breathing from your stomach, because it sounds very simple, but actually when you breathe from your stomach, it puts a little bit of pressure on your vagus nerve, and that helps to switch on your parasympathetic nervous system. So it sends a fundamental message to your amygdala saying that it's okay to calm down. No, everything's all right. It's okay to calm down. And my number, my oh, joint number one with that is go for a walk in a forest. Hmm. Because research shows that actually being in nature, especially in a forest where you've got lots of the fractal patterns of plant growth around you, will reduce your stress levels by up to 60% in half an hour to 40 minutes of walking in the forest. Hmm. And there's a difference between the kind of stimulation or whatever you call it, pleasure that you get from, let's say, playing a video game or watching videos on TikTok that are, or watching a movie versus what you get from breathing or walking in the forest. Can you talk a little bit about the difference? Yeah, sure. The, the principal difference is that most of the things that you've mentioned there are actually designed to engage the sympathetic nervous system. And that's the, the side of our autonomic nervous system, which actually relates to being alert looking out for trouble, ready to respond to any incoming missiles and stuff like that. So it means the amygdala is activated, the adrenaline levels are higher and stuff like that. And that means that actually you're not in the rest and digest side of your nervous system and your brain where you feel relaxed at ease and interesting ideas and solutions and pleasurable thoughts occur to you quite naturally and just through your mind. Yeah, we seek that kind of engagement, don't we? I saw recently a movie, I think it was a docudrama, I guess you could say, about the guy who created Tetris. Mm. And uh, Tetris is such an interesting uh, game because it somehow creates this total engagement where but also it cr creates some anxious anxiety so you're you these things are falling they're falling faster and faster you're having to move them you're having but it for, for whatever reason it completely absorbs people body and mind fingers mind yeah, yeah. Um, they even to the point where they're having dreams they're playing tetris in their dreams and mm -hmm. i think it's there's something very engaging about that state of flow. And although when you play, if you spend your life playing Tetris, you're, it's not necessarily that you're going to be able to apply that too much in the real world unless you, until it's like time to pack the trunk uh, of your car yeah. or, well, or a trip true. or whatever. That's true. <laughs> I, I think there may be, in the case of that kind of game, uh, I think there may be two things happening. Or in the case of a lot of games as well, there may be two things happening. One is that you're sympathetic nervous systems being stimulated by the storyline of threats or whatever. But also, I think that the repetition is probably inducing a state of light trance. Mm. So the default mode network may be switching on there, and you have that experience of being disengaged from normal reality from the rest of the world. And in, in a lot of cases, that can be quite restful. So people. do you think it's a good? Do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing or? A, a, I think it's be? ambivalent. <laughs> okay, I think of all kinds of mental states, like staring. I'm seeing the fire behind you, and I think about staring. Though, what's that state you're in when you're staring at a crackling fire? Mm. I can't remember the can't remember the technical term for it now, but it's almost certain that you are going into a daydream state, which has been described as being like trance. In other naming systems but certainly you're a bit more suggestible you're more open to stuff which is emerging from your subconscious as well you're not actively censoring and filtering the messages which are coming into your brain or coming out of your subconscious so you become more suggestible in a way the conscious mind and when you come down to it, at the end of the day all we really have in life is our attention at any given moment and what we do with that attention right hmm. and it seems like it it's something that we 
often don't think about. We let the world act on us. We wake up, we open up our email and that becomes our first input of the day. Or we turn on YouTube and that becomes the input for, or the news. If it's, if you choose to open the sense, most, more, most sensational type of news video versus the something that's more low key, all these things are decisions that we make. Actually, I think quite often the unconscious can be prompting us to do things which provide particular kinds of inputs to it. Mm -hmm. um, Antonio Damasio has done a lot of interesting work here where he actually says, you may think that the conscious mind is controlling the body and the subconscious to meet its desires, but actually it's the other way around. The conscious mind evolved to serve the body and the survival of that mm -hmm. body. So it will respond to, it will constantly be receiving messages which are based around that. But another evidence exists showing that uh, you can track the impulse to start doing something by looking at the active brain center, and you can show that the impulse to start doing something can occur several seconds before somebody has the experience of deciding to do it. So there's a lot of... So do we have, is, is there no such thing as free will then, Mike? Yeah, there, there's been a, there was a lot of discussion about that when that experimental evidence first came out. I think it was Libet who produced the original research, I think. But uh, it, like a lot of these things, it's great front page news. We have no, and I think someone even wrote a book or several books around it saying, we have no free will, there's no such thing. Everything happens as a result of the subconscious. And again, that's a kind of sensationalist way of presenting just one slice through a very complex, through a very complex reality. And I think the, the truth is that there's a dance, again, there's a dance between the two. There's reciprocity between the two. Because obviously there's a, a lot of evidence that the conscious mind can veto decisions made by the amygdala with training and repetition so it's possible for firemen and first responders to actually walk into the flames rather than running away from them yeah it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing right because just whether the conscious or the unconscious mind makes a decision it doesn't matter because still it's you making the decision whether it's you're it doing is. it consciously or not it's you're still yeah. making a choice yeah let's segue into what the impact is on possibility on what you can see as being possible here uh, with a little example. So if you've got something, if something happened to you a long time ago, which convinced you that no one wants to listen to you and that you should always shut up and stand in the corner, then that may actually get triggered every time you need to do public speaking or you need to phone someone up and ask them for something and actually stand in the way and mean that you don't make all the calls that you could make. It means you don't reach out and make all the connections you could reach out because nobody wants to hear from me. But if you can, and we use techniques which actually help to process that kind of material. So by freeing that up, by actually undoing that knot and dissolving it completely, people find, oh, actually that's gone. I actually, I really like reaching out and talking to people. I really connecting. That's much more natural to me. So there is that interplay happening. This There can be things happening in the subconscious, which actually the subconscious doesn't really want, and you don't really want, but they're hanging around there. And we can help with those. And I think that's a very important part of what we do. It's the first layer of what we do, really. What's the role of the unconscious mind in creating opportunity and creating possibility? immense <laughs> in one word recent research has shown that actually it, it's fundamental to creative thinking not just the default mode network but several other large neural networks get switched on when we're doing innovative creative thinking and in particular when we are accessing that great fountain of possible ideas you know what it's like when you start actually toying around with something and you let the flow of ideas occur we can help to facilitate that if it's blocked. But also, more importantly, we can actually help to focus the process that they call creative insight, which is the name given to that part of the creative process where you have to pull out of the great stream, great ocean of possibility, 
the things which are actually going to be relevant and helpful for whatever you happen to be working on at the time. And that involves three different large neural networks all working together. Do they have names, these three networks? They do. As the default mode network is working and the cerebellar network is working, which is actually the motor control network of positioning in space and reaching out to touch things and move and so on. And uh, the semantic network, the language network, mm. Very all working together. They all work together in, in creative insight. And one thing which I think is fascinating about that is that the cerebellum network, cerebellum, was considered to be such a primitive part of the brain that it used to get cut off quite often when they were showing it to medical students because it was considered to be so unimportant. No, it just controls movement. Mm. Nothing, nothing to look at here. Move along. <laughs> but in actual point of fact, now they've discovered that the cerebellum is networked into a huge number of higher brain functions. So these very basic functions may have started off as very basic functions become part of a much bigger holistic system. I have a question. So this is very interesting question for you. Why do ideas bubble up to the surface when like you're taking a shower or when you're walking around, just walking around randomly, why do they seem to appear in these kind of like Always when you have no paper handy. What is go what's going on with that? <laughs> We're allowing them to. We're allowing them to appear. We're giving them a chance to appear. And how do you, we do that? This is one of the things, actually, you said it's really interesting, just when you have no pen and paper handy. Yeah. That's one of the things that you can actually train yourself to do is to make sure you do have, so you have a pen and paper beside your bed. When you, oh, I do, Mike. Uh, trust me, I do. <laughs> yeah. Some people have it in the shower as well. They're the ones right. that, you, that you can't wash off. But the reason is because actually you relax. The default mode network switches on. You, you're closer to your subconscious because you're not actually using your brain in a tightly focused way. You're allowing images and ideas, dreams, bit fragments of thoughts willy-nilly to appear. So related to this question about when you're... Uh, you know, taking a walk or having a shower. There's something about the the moments or the, and again, going back to liminal space, the liminal space between being awake and asleep. There's mm. something that seems to be special about the, that almost asleep where you're not quite awake, but you haven't quite fallen asleep yet. And also on the same, the other side of that, when you're waking up, you're not you, you're not really sleeping, but you're not quite yet awake. There's a period of time, mm. it can be short, but there seems to be a period of time in there that has a, a, just a very interesting mental state that seems to be... Uh, that is the That is what I see as being the target state for when we do liminal coaching guided relaxations, is mm. to actually be in exactly that state. Do you have a name for that state? It's known by several different names. I think one is hypnagogic. It's the hypnagogic state halfway between sleep and waking. You could consider it to be similar to types of trance. It could be considered to be similar to some types of meditation, but not active meditation. There's and a great... why, is that, why is that state uh, important? Why do you target that state when you're working in, in liminal coaching? Let's see, a couple of reasons. One is that Einstein's school report had written on it. He seems to spend most of his time daydreaming at one point. Mm. And he daydreamed his way right into the theory of relativity by taking imaginary journeys on beams of light, mm -hmm. which is pretty impressive when you think about it. Yeah. And then there's the guy who came up with the periodic table, who had worked on it for years and years. And so he knew there was something there. He'd done huge amounts of research and and... I've uh, spoken to lots and lots of other people who are still uh, also working in the same field. But then by his own account, he could not actually work out what the new pattern or new paradigm was until he saw it. And he says, I saw it three times in a waking dream. And on the third occasion, I wrote it down. And only later did I need to make one or two minor corrections. 
Okay, so those are two great examples, and I think Poincaré wrote a little bit about this as well. There's something about a rhythm that happens between pronounced and serious conscious effort on something, consciously working on a problem, but also uh, having a rhythm between that conscious effort and periods of refractory or or reflection periods where the unconscious is processing. So that's when you go for a walk. I don't, I don't absolutely. know what I'm going to do anymore. I go for a walk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Talk and about that rhythm. Is that what? what... I, th- I think that's a really important point to make is that we aren't saying, although some people would, we certainly do not say, oh, if you just got in touch with your unconscious enough and with your intuition enough, you don't have to worry about doing any active hard work thinking. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't work like that. It works in the way that you were just describing, which is that you do the you do the hard work, but you also do the create the space to allow your subconscious to make its contribution. And that's what and is we, that a way of crank? Is that kind of the way that you crank the wheel of creativity? You have you have conscious problem solving, goal directed behavior, and then you sleep on it, or you go for a walk. And is that what a good relationship with your unconscious looks like? It's exactly what it looks like. You use a guided relaxation, or you do some a particular kind of meditation that you want to do. So you can be, you can actually be intentional about the unconscious part as well as the conscious. Exactly. Part. Yeah, that's exactly what we're saying. Is we've been trained not to be intentional about this extremely important part of ourselves and our relationship with it. And this is a body of techniques and a, a bunch of approaches which enable you to become much more intentional to release unprocessed subconscious material which might be getting in your way and just allow yourself to work better. That's great. I'm gonna, I am gonna. want to dive into that toolkit in a minute. Before we go there, though, let's go back to that person who's saying, wow, I, I never even thought about my unconscious. I'm a stranger to my unconscious, uh, but I have this kind of silent partner that has been around my whole life. How do I introduce myself? How would I begin if I haven't ever had if I haven't ever had an intentional conversation with my unconscious mm-hmm. mind, how would you suggest I in- initiate that or introduce myself? There are a lot of great techniques for doing that, but probably one of the simplest ones is if you have the idea that you've got a silent partner, allow them to speak and imagine them and say hello and imagine what do they say back. There's an interesting trick. I, I I can't remember exactly where I came across it. It was, I think, in a book on psychotherapy where you actually write a note to your subconscious self. And it could be your younger self, for example, with your dominant hand. So if you're right-handed, you use your right hand. If you're left-handed, mm. you use your left hand. But then you allow it to write back with your non-dominant hand. Oh, so wow. start writing with your non-dominant hand and see what comes out. Now, of course, it's going to be a bit of a scribble, but if you do it with the intention of connecting with your subconscious, then you can get some interesting results. Wow. It's a, it's a technique which can be really useful if your sub, if your amygdala, your subconscious, actually is reacting against you doing something that you consciously want to do. So you consciously want to do something, and it keeps going, oh, we don't want to do that, that's too scary. Last time we did that, we really got messed up. No, we don't (laughs) want to go out there. You don't want to go out there. It's too frightening and horrible and nasty. Let's stay inside Mm -hmm. and stay inside and not go out the cave. So what you can do then is you can write to it in using that technique. And you can say, yeah, I really want to understand more about how you're feeling and why you're feeling that. And I'd like to ask you, under what circumstances would you think about it being okay to go out? And because I want to reassure you that it is actually okay. And then let it write back about the fears and what it's feeling and why it doesn't want to do it. And and you can establish a dialogue doing that and, and it will slowly change. Yeah, so I can know uh, that's so we're getting now onto toolkit technique, to, tips, tricks, I guess, I guess tools so. and techniques, which is great. And one thing I heard was one way to introduce yourself to your unconscious is just lay back, close your eyes, daydream, and mm-hmm. imagine a conversation and say, hey, yeah. what can I do for you? How can I be helpful to you? What is your role in my life? How do you see your role? 
Yeah. Just to go consciously ask the questions and then just wait to see what comes into your mind as an answer. Right. Honestly. Allow the thoughts to come up. And and remember to have your pad of paper and pencil. That's another way of thinking about it too, is uh, to write. And I will share a tool that I have um, that I've been using and part of it partly from your guidance, Mike, is I try and make space for that time just before falling asleep and that time just upon waking, because I think they're they're really powerful periods mm -hmm. of time and very important to be intentional and thoughtful about. So mm -hmm. when I go to sleep, I try and spend a little bit of time just reflecting on the day, what happened, what it meant uh, to me. And then I, I try and ask if I have one, even if I don't, I try to put something on the doorstep of my unconscious to process my yeah. sleep. Yeah, it's um, a great practice. Might be, it might be something that I'm working on or something that I'm thinking about. And then when I wake up, before I do anything else, before I look at my uh, phone emails or anything, which is a habit, um, I will just wake up and write down stream of consciousness for about 20 minutes, whatever's in my head. And that has been tr a tremendously powerful, um, and it, it goes to that rhythm, but it's become a really powerful practice, just a habit. And it, I find it's a way of generating material that's original because most of the times if you're reading a book, you're going to take notes on the book, you're watching a TV show, you're going to be influenced by that. It's like the first person, when you have a question in a meeting, the first person to speak anchors everyone else's thoughts around that idea. And you might not get a lot of uh, creativity if that first idea isn't way off the mark. There's something about just starting with a blank slate that happens first thing in the morning that I don't think you can ever repeat at any other point in the day. Yeah, I think it's a really valuable practice, what you're describing. And there are some... There are quite a lot of people who use one or other similar type of technique. I know of at least one neuroscientist who, when they feel that they're stuck on a particular problem, they will imagine themselves writing the problem down on a piece of paper and putting it in an imaginary envelope and posting it into an imaginary post box to their subconscious. And then waking up, they wake up the next morning with the next step or the solution to the problem. They won't go public. I can imagine. Thing. I can imagine you could do that with a real envelope and a real post box or with by lighting something up. People do that with lighting wishes on fire and Absolutely. stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they all work as well, depending mm -hmm. on how intentional you are about them. And I was saying that when you talk about that, imagining that conversation with your unconscious, I think that is part of what happens in the morning reflection when I'm a stream of consciousness writing. I think that could be another way to have a conversation with your unconscious is just to be writing the questions, writing yeah. the first answers that come to mind, just letting you following your intuition and so forth. Yeah, you've got a great, you've set up a, a great relationship with your subconscious by doing that. You're making the space there for it to, for okay. that so, exchange to happen. So let's say we've had that introduction. We've got to meet each other. We've, we've had an imaginary kind of conversation. I've got some kind of rapport what are some things in the toolkit that can help people think about okay now i've got a relationship we want to be a good with my unconscious we've got a good partnership what are the what are some of the things that we can do together what are some good practices how do you what's a creative push-up look like what's the workout what's the gym what's the mental gym that we're what are the what are the exercises I, activities that's really an interesting question and i actually think that Although there are an infinite number of similarities between people, there are also an infinite number of uniquenesses. And whilst we can, with the similarities, provide a framework within which things can happen, what will actually happen is going to be emergent and unique to for that particular person themselves. So I would say that is actually the question you've just asked. It's a question that you can put to the subconscious and you can say, OK, where does this take us? What opens up now? What becomes possible now? OK, yeah. So I got a few here. One is I know I just had a conversation with a friend of mine. And I think this is some people will do this. They will give themselves a constraint, but just a completely random constraint. I had one. I was going to write a blog post every day. It was a 
just a constraint that said, I'm going to do this guy I was talking to just, I think yesterday or the day before was saying, yeah, I have, I had a baby and I was walking around and I just gave myself this constraint that I'm going to, I'm going to do a three minute video every day while I'm walking around with the baby in my, <laughs> pull up my camera and just have this three minute thing. And right. so it's going to be about something. I'm going to publish it. What do you think of that? Like idea of just taking a period of time, giving yourself a, a habit, whether I have another friend who just started picking up grocery lists, mm-hmm. he would pick up a grocery list in the grocery store that people had abandoned, left behind. And he would ask, what's the story behind this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why is this person getting milk, eggs, and vodka? Yeah. those are great ways of actually creating an open field for your subconscious to actually make suggestions into Mm. just great ways of doing that so i love the story one by the way that's a really good one but when you say constraints if you think about it everything that makes sense has to be constrained in one way or another you can't have a absolutely completely open openness or that nothing at all happens everything just drifts away so really, it's a, like a container. You're making, you're creating a space, a contained space within which it's possible for these things to happen. It's possible for me to pick up a grocery list. In, this, in that space, I can pick up a grocery list and I can make up a story. I can allow a story to emerge. I can walk around with the baby, which is like a great work, a great living metaphor for the unconscious <laughs> i'm going to walk around the room with i'm going to walk around the room with this living symbol of my unconscious and then i'm going to see what happens when i want to be creative about something yeah and those are things you can do just you don't have to do them forever you can say yeah. i'm going to do this until it doesn't work for me anymore uh, yeah yeah it has to be fun that's the other thing yeah. i think it has there has to be an element of fun in it yeah, because you'll find that when you write to your subconscious, if you want to persuade it to do something that it's being difficult about, it's a pretty good idea to say something along the lines of, yeah, if you help me out with this, then we'll go and see the ducks and feed them. And we may even have ice cream. Yeah, okay. So another, I saw just a couple of tools I heard one. Uh, another one is uh, just asking questions. So ask a question that you don't know the answer to. Yeah. Ask it out loud, write it on a sheet of paper or how. Do you have any thoughts about a good way to, I know you talked about an imaginary post box. That's a good way of doing it. You can, you can use a screen, an imaginary screen. If you like, if you like terminals, Hey, why you, you can have a metaphor. I was thinking about this the other day. You can have a metaphor where actually your subconscious is the supreme AI, right? And you just, type in, you, it's, your quantum chat GPT, vastly superior to anything you can buy. And you type your question into that and see what it comes back with. That's interesting. And a lot of people are using AI in that way, is asking existential questions and deep questions that AI is... Isn't that interesting? Because really what's happening is that they're, they're using the AI, I think, as a projective field of possibility. And I know a number of people who are doing that. They're, they don't, they don't, they actually, in one case, I know somebody who is successfully using the AI's tendency to hallucinate to as a rich seed, mm. series of seeds for their own creative thinking. Yeah, I've, and I've used, especially in the mid journey, some of the visual AI, because the unconscious kind of speaks in the language of images and metaphors. I found that it can be very a very interesting conversation when you start putting thoughts into a, something a visual AI like Midjourney as a without trying to necessarily create a picture, but asking questions and putting thoughts in. It's a little bit like a magic mirror. I was like, "What are my thoughts, and what is reflecting back?" That's an interesting game. Talk about games that you can give yourself to play. That's a very interesting one. To, a meditative. Of course, it can be addictive too. Yeah, I, um, I think that's true. I, of course, I because of what I do, I tend to think of the imagination as being the single most extraordinary instrument of investigation and articulation in existence. Uh, so there's nothing that can come close to it when it comes to 
when it comes to creating reality, mm -hmm. uh, it comes to investigating reality, your imagination and what you can do with your own mind will pretty much outstrip any external thing. The external thing might help you to trigger the process, but at the end of the day, what's really being triggered is this extraordinary capability that we all have. Do you think AI could be can be a, a useful tool for exploring your relationship with your unconscious? Yeah, I think it can be, depending on how it's used. Like anything else, really. Mm -hmm. You talked about uh, the fire earlier on. You can see in the background here, of course, staring into the flames of a fire and seeing what thoughts occur has been a, a, a visioning practice for millennia in almost every single culture on record. Yeah, I, AI is one more thing that you can look at. And what mm -hmm. you look at is what you look at is going to be an intriguing, complex, and always rich mixture of what you're projecting outwards and stuff which doesn't match your projection coming back in. Yeah, so there's something about there's something about a rhythm. There's something about it's almost like I picture a water wheel going down under the water and coming back out again, or some kind, or the sun going across the sky and then the moon going across in a diurnal and nocturnal rhythm between the this uh, conscious and unconscious mind. I don't want to say gears, but some there's some kind of there's some kind of a rhythm or a dance that's mm. going on there. Mm. No, it's definitely, I like the metaphor of the dance. It's one I use a lot. But I, I think it's also worth saying that in those states where you are relaxed and your ordinary mode of thinking has dropped away for a little while, it's possible for us to have incredibly powerful and exciting experiences of sensing and feeling and seeing things come together or suddenly make sense and things like that. So there's a, that's a pretty good feeling. I think it can be a bodily feeling as well at the same time, because our consciousness is really embedded in our physical body completely. Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay, talk about the metaphor game. Tell, talk a little bit about the metaphor game. I think that's a really fun one. Yeah, metaphor is wonderful. I... I I could go on about metaphor forever, so stop me if I get too sidetracked here. Yeah. Just a word of warning. So the metaphor game is something which evolved from looking at how much information is contained in the metaphors that people use. There's a huge amount of work out there around all of this stuff. I'm not the first person to use it for innovation. There's an outfit up in Seattle which has been using metaphor to make things, as they call it, making things strange since the so, 60s. So uh, how do you play the metaphor game? You play the metaphor game by asking somebody to tell you what kind of landscape they see if they think about a problem or an issue that they have in terms of it being a landscape. What does the landscape look like? You ask them to describe it. Okay. And so give it, me a, can you give me an example of what, how the metaphor game plays out or how it might play yeah, out? Yeah, I can. Uh, for example, we had uh, one session where uh, a volunteer said, oh, I'd like to play the metaphor game. I've got an issue I'm working on. Okay, so what does your landscape look like? I'm on a path and there's a huge boulder in front of me. Is there any way around it? No, there's no way around it. It's completely blocking the path. Can you climb on the boulder? Yes, I can climb on the boulder. Can you see over the top? Yes, I can. So what do you see when you look over the top of the boulder? The whole path is right off into the distance, completely covered with boulders. There's nothing but boulders in that path. <laughs> nothing but boulders. So can you see anything else to the left or right of you? Of you? I said, yes, to the right, there's some grass, there's a field. And is there anything in the distance, further in the distance that you can see? Yeah, across the grass, there's a forest. So there's a field and there's a forest off to the side of the boulder and the path, is there? Yes, there is. Do you think there's possibly a way across the grass and through the forest to where you want to get to? And they, just, and they went, yeah, yes, there is. 
And then he said, so did that help with your, did that help with the issue? And they said, yeah, that actually helped enormously. Interestingly, they never had to tell us what the issue was. They didn't mm -hmm. have to describe it. They only needed to describe the metaphor. And by working with the metaphor, they came to a resolution, which again, they didn't have to share. So it was great fun. Yeah, it reminds me of this game from back in the 1970s. My dad was a computer scientist and they had this game called Adventure. There are similar games. They were called Dungeon or, but they were text games where they would just say, you're in a room mm. and there's a door and there's there's some stuff on the, there's a piece of paper on the ground and you would do things like pick up paper or, and that people would describe that it's hard to, it's hard to describe how fun that is until you've actually done it. But the games, those text-based games are so stimulating to the imagination I think largely because of what they don't say and how much they leave to your imagination. And when you describe the metaphor game, it sounds almost like one of those adventure text-based games where you're you're looking around trying to figure out what to do without having yeah. a lot of clues. Yeah. There are lots of there's several different technical descriptions for it. One one they call it initiated symbol projection. But the idea is you create a field of possibility within which things can happen. And that's actually a key component of writing and putting together the guided relaxations that we use. There's a carefully constructed metaphorical journeys through particular scenarios and landscapes, which do have a definite, they have definite underlying purpose. But that purpose is not overtly stated and the person who is having the experience of it is free to project into that scenario their own material. So it provides a rich field of possibility. And then what happens, what actually happens for the person themselves is emergent. And I think that's wonderful because it means that it's the pers that person's journey. They own it completely right from the beginning, right the way through. Yeah. Do you have any more uh, kind of like techniques or tips from your toolkit that people can do in their own kind of quiet, personal, reflective way, whether it's in the journal or um, in their daily life um, to help prompt more creative thinking oh, or generative thought? We actually have a we have a tool that I give. I always give away to anyone who comes to work with me who's suffering from overwhelm at work, which is called Liminal Pomodoro, which is basically the instruction to stop every hour, put a timer on, stop every hour and spend at least three to five minutes mind wandering, deliberately mind wandering. Now, I've had incredibly busy, incredibly overworked, overstressed people use that technique and they have seen a big boost in their productivity and a big reduction in their levels of stress so it's a very simple thing to do but it's very powerful and very effective when we provide the tool though we also provide references to the science behind why mind wandering helps with solving finding solutions to problems so that if if they get quizzed about why they're staring blankly out of the window for five minutes every hour they can Hold this up and say, "Who's science?" <laughs> I'm noticing a common theme here, uh, Mike, uh, which is to try and describe it from a few different angles. One is this idea that you want to loosen your grip on your focus of your thinking. It's it also strikes me as like when you'll intentionally blur your eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I can just take off my glasses and think. Yeah. Get, or just focusing on what's in your peripheral vision. Or like all the things that you can do that can essentially you know, loosen your grip or distract your conscious mind or direct your attention towards things that are, even when you have a conversation with a friend that has no purpose, it's not a work conversation. Mm -hmm. It seems like that's, those are the kinds of things that allow all the possibilities inside of us to emerge. It's just, yeah, it's, it's an immensely natural process. So I think that a lot of people have uh, their own ways and means and techniques of communicating with their subconscious, which work well for them. And that's great. And I think what we do is to just help to make those a, a 
more conscious and to add some others as well and just supercharge what's already a perfectly natural process for people. Yeah, it's almost like we've gotten so good at filling all the spare moments of our day with productivity. Now you can check your email on your phone while you're waiting in line somewhere. And it sounds like part of what you're saying is just get in touch with your boredom. Yeah, maybe it may seem like you're being bored or not doing anything. It may it feels to us quite often when we're daydreaming as if we're not doing very much, but actually the amount of energy our brain is using has gone up. And underneath the surface, rather the, the story about the duck paddling, there's a frantic amount of activity happening while the subconscious gets to work. And it says, oh, thank God, that guy's given us a break. Now we can do the complexity processing. And it calls on this library of billions and billions of different types of complex process that it runs all the time and says, okay, so which one is this most like? And we can put a couple of these together, tweak that bit there, change that bit there, and then send it back up. Yeah, maybe boredom, uh, maybe it's more creating more space in your day, uh, leaving yeah. yourself more, uh, you know, a time that where you're not requiring yourself to be productive or yes. doing anything in particular. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. In, in fact, um, I have the, a number of people that I've worked with who have been suffering from overwhelm at work and incredibly busy schedules. After um, three or four sessions of, of really being taught how to relax properly again and remembering how to relax properly again and draining out a lot of accumulated stress, I asked them the question, so you've been doing this now for a little while and you've been using liminal pomodoro, so I want to ask you this question. When you think about, if you think back to when you felt like you were overwhelmingly busy, how much of what you were doing do you think was actually having a real impact on your productivity? And the answer, if it's honest, is usually around about 30 to 40 percent. Hmm. And the rest is busyness for the sake of feeling that we are meeting the requirement to be productive. Yeah, that, that resonates. Okay, Mike. So you've you've spent a lot of time thinking about this. You've been working on in this area for your whole life, really. And you have you have created a practice around it. You've created a business. Could you talk a little bit? I know that there are many different ways that people can engage uh, with what you're doing. Everything from at the low end, just participating in all the free stuff that you do, workshops yeah. and so forth. There's also subscription service, which I subscribe to. There's also a course that you're teaching and there's private coaching and team coaching. So could you maybe just go through those one at a time and starting maybe at the very low end with the free stuff? Um, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I don't absolutely guarantee to, this, to do this, but generally I do a free webinar every month and there's a free newsletter which notifies about the webinar and other stuff that we're doing and contains some tips and bits of advice and stuff. So starting with the free webinar, what yeah. they're about an hour. I've been to a few. Could you just describe to people what do they get if they show up for that? Sure. We do a super fast introduction on how liminal coaching works. Um, we take the topic of the month and there's a short presentation on that. And that's followed by an appropriate guided relaxation uh, which complements the, the presentation, the analysis of the subject matter. But one month it might be boundaries, the next month it might be abundance, that kind of thing. Oh, that's great. And I've been to those. And so that, I think that's great. And just to point out, because that's a, a great opportunity for people to experience guided relaxation yeah. in, in an environment which is very similar to what would happen in a one-on-one -on -one coaching or get what they would get from the subscription service. For me, it's very much a great opportunity to, it's like a wine tasting. It's an idea. It's an opportunity to have a chance to experience what it feels like. And I would recommend it to anyone. Yeah, it's great. I like doing them. So then there's another next level up from that, I would say, is uh, subscription, right? How what do, what do people get when they subscribe to the subscription service? 
the subscription service provides once a week each issue contains a problem or an area of interest that someone's sent in a little bit of analysis and explanation and then a link to the guided relax uh, to a guided relaxation which will help with that issue or that question so you basically get uh, a guided relaxation and an explanation of how to use it each week and once a month the guided relaxation will be completely new dealing with a new subject i love that and i'm a subscriber mike and i love it because I will tell you that every time there's a new one, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna, I listen to it when I as I'm going to sleep that night. And it's like a very, it's a very interesting kind of collection that I'm starting to build up there. So thank yeah, you for that. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then so the next level from that would be you have a course, mm -hmm. uh, a six week course, is it that you're teaching? It's a, it's a six week course we're teaching under the umbrella of the School of the Possible, and it is an integration process i'll say that in six sessions which build on one another and push the envelope of what's possible for the individual all the individuals involved it's going to be great fun yeah so the liminal explorations course if i do want to introduce myself to my unconscious or i want to improve my relationship with my unconscious and i want to really build a, a solid creative partnership that would be a great that's a great way of doing it yeah, that's a great way of doing it. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. I, I, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, then, so then the next level beyond that would be client work, like working with you, like you would work with a therapist or any kind of professional service provider as a as an individual or a team, correct? Yes, that's right. So there's quite a big difference. Uh, working with individuals, is a pretty, there's, that's a pretty set protocol. So I, I offer a, a free half hour discussion to talk about how we work together and what you will get from it and what the results should be and if it's going to be suitable for you. So I find out first what it is you want to work on and then it's 50 minutes a session. Uh, with groups, it depends on what the group or the, the buyer wants to do. We have a range of different possibilities which are tailor-made. The most exciting and interesting is where we get a, a team of people uh, from a particular organization who say, for example, want to increase their innovation. And we get them to uh, create a joint metaphor landscape for what that journey looks like, and then write guided relaxations for that and supplement that with one-to-one -one sessions. Thank you so much, Mike. So if someone is uh, watching or listening to this right now and they want to get in touch with you, they want to find out more, where's the best place for them to? Well, they can go to the website, which is uh, liminalcoaching.com or liminalcreatives.com, or they can just email me. I'm always happy to chat to people on email. And that's Great. Mike, Mike at liminalcoaching.com. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Thank you for your time today. Really appreciate diving into liminal explorations and possibilities. Thank you so much for joining us, Mike. I appreciate the opportunity, Dave, and it's always a pleasure to speak with you about this stuff. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for joining us on The Art of the Possible. To learn more and discover your best next step, come visit us at schoolofthepossible.com. See you next time. Okay, so now we can chill. We can relax. Okay, good. How did that feel? <laughs> okay, I think, what did you think? I'm, I'm very, yeah, different. very, I'm yeah, not a very like, good judge, I don't think. I think it would be fun and interesting to have, if you had a, like a, a one or two page PDF that just had 10 little exercises you could try or maybe it's a blog post just i think it'd be these little they, they may seem trivial but these little things like asking yourself imagine a conversation with your unconscious just like a little mm. toolkit and it might even has things as simple as going for a walk but also mm. the metaphor game i think is i think that's a game you could play by yourself it is yeah yeah and then different ways of you can introduce yourself to your your unconscious but there might be other conversations you might want to have I think about it like a, a marriage or any kind of partnership let's say there's conflict how do you address yeah. you you've touched on that a little bit how do you address conflict with your unconscious how do you address 
where can we go to where's the best place we can go together where do you want to go for dinner whatever <laughs> it seems like there might be some interesting um prompts almost that you could give people or i think i that has been in my mind and um, it's been pretty i've been pretty busy but yeah. is it mine to do that there are so many things i should do and could do <laughs> it's a really great idea it's a really good idea I had one of the things that I put in place in my, I've been, I thought a lot this year about what worked la uh, over the uh, winter break, about what worked really well last year and what I want to focus on and how to build a daily, weekly, monthly kind of rhythm for my year. Hmm. And one of the things I gave myself as a task is to write every Monday a Monday memo, which is a, its tagline is food for thought to fuel your week. I remember. I get it. Yeah. yeah. So that puts me on the a hot seat every week yeah. to be like, okay, what is the thing that I think is most useful or interesting to think about? It also puts it on me to reflect on, okay, what have I been reflecting on this week? What yeah. is important? I did that. I did that for two years with mm. Yeek. I every day. I have a 380 pages uh, of text posts. Uh, they're not verbatim from the Yi King, but they're things I wrote, little pieces I wrote, which were all suggested by trying a Yi King hex gum first. Did um, you publish those? Or? Yeah, they get published in in a circle at the moment. They go out on LinkedIn, my Facebook and Instagram mm. every day. And, and by the time we reach the end of them, everyone will have forgotten what they are. So we just start again. <laughs> And I actually was thinking of putting them into, several people have said uh, I should put them into a book along with the photos that I did with them. It's easy to make things more complicated than they need to be. And it's also so easy to test these days in a small way. Mm. And the first test is, okay, do people, when you post it on LinkedIn, do people like it? And it sounds like that's the answer to that is yes. Or Instagram, do people like it? Then the second step is <laughs> find a way to quickly publish it before i made the before i actually went through the effort of making a card deck i tested the concept by selling a poster and it wasn't hard for me to go from sketching these things to sketching them on an ipad to making a poster it took some time but it was a lot less time consuming than creating a card deck would be and lo and behold the, so the poster sold really well so it's, i think you can go from I like the idea of small steps. And of course, once I had, once I knew that people would buy the poster, then I, then I had confident enough confidence to go. I went through the Kickstarter process, which was, oh God, I, I wouldn't do that again. It's getting late there, but. That was incredible. Your fire useful. went out, Mike. Always useful. It hasn't quite gone in. It's just, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. It's, it, trust me. Once it gets heated up, it stays hot most of the nights. So. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Good to see you. Great to see you. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. <laughs> All right, Mike. Have a great evening, and it was Thank really you. enjoyable talking to you. No. You have a great day. It's always yeah. a pleasure to speak to you. Yeah, we will do. Likewise. Bye-bye. Take care, Mike. Bye. Bye.